for about the next 30 minutes is productive plants for forest gardens. So maybe you can start Kirsty with just saying what your interest is and what you'd like people to contribute and then yeah you can invite people to contribute. Okay thanks Sophie. Um, this question has come about because I'm on the uh, forest gardening course with Rakesh um, and we're I think we're just about to go into week four where we've been um, getting into our designs we've looked at what plants are um, on the site and now we're looking at what trees and plants would complement um, what's there and having looked through so many of these Latin names um, and seeing how there's so many different criteria to go through you know in terms of the kind of conditions that those plants like um, but also what you want in your forest garden it uh, it just got me thinking let's talk to some some people who might know a bit more hands-on you know practical kind of insights as to what works what has worked for you what are maybe your top three or top five most productive trees and plants in in your forest garden um I don't know what the hard what the the I imagine Bulgaria and Romania and those areas are quite similar in terms of being temperate like the UK, is, is that right? Because I'd, I'd be interested to know um, across the board. I think the main difference is like, for example, in the UK, it's a maritime climate. So because you're surrounded there like an island by the sea, um, you've got like, um, it's a more humid climate. So as everyone knows, like more cloud, more rain, distributed rainfall, um, and then like not so much uh, sun. So Bulgaria and then Romania, it's more like a, um, um, it's more, what's the word I'm looking for? Landlocked. Yeah, it's landlocked. So it's a continental climate. Right. So because we haven't, we've got like the Black Sea, but we haven't got like a true big body of water. You don't have that kind of balance. So we tend to have like cold uh, winters and then very hot, dry summers. So it has a kind of climate analog with some parts of like North America, which are the same in the centre. Um, right. There are a lot of overlap in terms of plants that you can grow in both places. But then there are some things kind of on the edge that maybe the UK has a milder winter that would be difficult in some parts of Bulgaria. And then there are some things in Bulgaria that you could grow more productively because of the kind of the, the heat and the sun in the summer that would be hard to fruit well, for example, in the UK. But there's a big overlap, yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. So who wants to begin with their top five forest garden species? Uh, can I jump in there? Yeah, go for it, please. Uh, I'm sorry, my camera's still not working. I'm, I'm, I'm madly going through the settings to try and make it work, but I've, I've never done a, vid, um, a webcam from this particular computer before. Um, yeah, just uh, what Sophie's just said is, is, is very true. We're in central Bulgaria here, in, uh, right in the center of Bulgaria near Kazanlet. And, and um, yeah, in the Valley of Roses. Um, and what you said is very true about the climate here. You know, the, 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 we're zone seven. Uh, if people are familiar with the USDA zone system, we're zone 7A here. So we get temperatures of about minus 15 to minus 20 in the winter uh, and, and hot summers, you know, 35 degrees this summer was was uh, almost a record breaking summer uh, we had this year. Uh, top top um, forest garden plants. Um, I mean, we only moved here two years ago. So our main emphasis was nitrogen fixing shrubs and trees really to improve the fertility of the soil. And like Sophie's just said, the climate is similar to places in America, you know, like the Carolinas and so on. And um, so we planted quite a lot of things like black locust, honey locust, um, uh, all sorts of, all the acacias and things like that. Um, and uh, various shrubs and so on that, that fix nitrogen to try and get the, get the soil fertility high. Um, but yeah, I, I, Bulgaria is an excellent climate for fruit growing here, and and, and forest gardening is uh, is is really the way to go, I think, in in Bulgaria and and other places around here. Like I think uh, Romania was mentioned as well, wasn't it? 
Um, very good for fruit growing uh, because we don't have a lot of the problems that you get with fruit growing in the UK. You know, we, we have a, a less humid climate, so there are less fungal diseases. Um, but there again, uh, in Britain, the you don't get the, here, you don't get the understory that you get in Britain. If you want a good herbal underlayer of your forest garden here, then you have to irrigate really or, or plant very drought hardy plants, um, you know, the, the, the herbs and things like that to grow as understory. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you're starting a new forest garden in, in, in somewhere and the, the land is degraded, then really, I suppose, um, especially with the continental climate, you need to get your overstory sorted out really with um, a, a ratio of maybe two or three to one with nitrogen fixers just to build up that, um, that soil fertility. Uh, is that OK? How does that sound? Yeah, thank you. That's that's really useful. Um... I didn't. I haven't heard about the two to one ratio of nitrogen fixers, so that's an interesting one for for ground that you know is is lacking that that fertility. So yeah, thank you for that. So what you might want to consider as well, Kirsty, um, is in terms of those kind of like pioneer species or nurse plants that are going to help your other trees grow. Is yeah, you've got like the the pseudo acacias, like Steve um, mentioned. Um, but you could also think about the Eliagnus family. Maybe you've already covered that with Rakesh, but that's a favorite of his as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, yes. And they're wonderful because as Rakesh is just experiencing now with some thorns from pseudo acacia and his finger, um, you do have the problem if you want to do like a classic chop and drop that you end up chopping a lot of spiky trees everywhere. And the same with the honey locust, the Gladichia, that has like these amazing, like giant thorns that you could like go hunting with. Um, so yeah, the Eliagnus is a great one because again, it's nitrogen fixing, um, it's fast growing. You can um, you can prune it a lot, and it's a very dense, grows very densely. So it's a great windbreak. Um, it has quite small leaves so that they're a really nice falling mulch on your understory plants um, and a nutritious mulch. And it also has a fruit. So there is a spiky Eliagnus, um, but the ones that I think I prefer using are the Eliagnus multiflora and the Eliagnus um, umbellata. Um, so and that's like those the, two are evergreen though so if you want it as a yeah. permanent uh, hedge then yeah ebendii is uh, but uh, yeah but for if you're happy for it to be deciduous then those two are fantastic yeah and no thorns ah. <laughs> actually even the um the, the rubinias and the acacias you can eat the the flowers typically mm -hmm. for most of those so you need to be very careful, always research it first because they're in the kind of leguminaceae family, which so some of the most poisonous things on this planet are in that particular family. So really research it well before you try eating flowers or anything from that family. Thank you. Christina? Um. One of my favorite plants, which I've been observing years after years, it's a Turkish rocket, Bunia orientalis. It is abundant now in my garden. It is huge. It is huge. I love it because it's a very, very, very sturdy plant. It makes a big rosette of uh, leaves and it withstands some of the winter too. So I, you know, if there are lots of greens or lots of stuff to eat, you know, throughout the year, then the problem is you love to eat something green, you know, in winter, in early summer, in early spring, sorry. And so it, I mean, it is completely pushed back really by the hardest frost, you know, later, later in the year. So I have it fresh for, for the winter, you know, which is something really precious to me. And if I look at how it is my, in my garden now, it is really huge and big. I haven't harvested it all summer. So it's really, you know, <laughs> A pretty good reserve there, and I love it because it's a very sturdy plant. Uh, it's similar in 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 habit with the horseradish, which is a very very sturdy and powerful plant. Um, well, it has a nice taste, and it's also like brassicas are very close to pioneer plants. I mean, they are not so demanding on you know they are more bacterial uh, soil than fungal soil, 
so they'll be do so they'll be doing pretty fine in almost you know any grassless gra grass like setting or you know a garden which you set in a grassland um really i mean you can eat the the flowers too um so it's, it's really a plant i love <laughs> And it's not attacked by, you know, pests and diseases of the other brassicas, even perennial kales and stuff like that. It doesn't get the, you know, the the bugs, you know, the red and black bug, which is close relative of the stinky bug. Uh, it didn't get aphids. It didn't get anything. <laughs> and it tastes like cabbage. <laughs> so it's, it's one of my horrible, favorites. Hmm? It's horrible. It tastes I love, horrible. I, love, I like it. Ah, no. I like it. <laughs> you're, 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 you're the first person I've met who actually likes Turkish rocket. That's uh, that's impressive. Maybe yeah, I think he likes it actually because I got one from them from their nursery. So maybe on different soils, it's more tasty. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It, it is a little bit hairy, and uh, and you know the the tenderest leaves are better. But overall, I you know it's for me it's better than a lot of other perennial brassicas which I've tried to grow. Yeah, here in England, it's really, really bitter, really bitter. And yeah, I mean, obviously it's pungent. It's you know, it's a, it's a, it's a brassicaceae. It's a part of the mustard family, and so it's meant to be a little bit pungent. But this is just unpalatable here in the UK. Anyway, mm. I don't think I've ever had it in Romania or Bulgaria. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's as a winter green. Mm. I really yeah. do. Sorry. <laughs> it's a really nice winter green. It's not a perennial, but it really easily sells seeds. Is Claytonia, which is like also known as like minus lettuce. And that I got these kind of tiny seeds that are very prolific. And I planted it once and it's really hardy. It grows really well in the winter and it just comes up every year. And it's really nice, especially if you have like alliums and other like taller things because it creates a nice ground cover. I don't know if you know it. It's got like these kind of tiny, almost like heart-shaped um, leaves. And it's like quite a juicy, kind of almost like a succulent, like a purslane. And it grows in these kind of little uh, bunches. But if you check Claytonia, um, yeah, it's a really nice one. And it really easily spreads. And you can just, yeah, it comes up again, like during the autumn and, yeah, over the winter. And then has really beautiful white flowers coming up in the spring. Christina? Another plant which I love and is similar in habit to Clytonia is uh, Sherville, Sh Garden Sherville, and mm -hmm. three schools. Sherville, yeah. Yeah, they yeah I, I hope I pronounce it well. So I hope you all understand what I'm talking about. Sherville. Yeah. And I, Sherville, yeah. yeah it, it's also a self-seeder. So I have uh, cared and, you know, seeded it once and cared for it once. And since then it's, uh, been uh, self sowing and taking care of itself, same as Claytonia. Uh, and even now it's, uh, you know, this big, I can eat the greens already and I will have it again, you know, some part of the winter and, and I will have it next spring too. I don't know really if it really dies back or is it new seeds that come in spring. But anyway, that patch always has <laughs> something green on it and it's awesome. Has anyone tried a uh... Chinese artichoke. Chinese artichoke. It's in the family of. Uh, it's um, it's in the mint family, but it has these What's really the crazy little it? tubers. It's a Chinese artichoke. Looks really mm. weird. Looks. Turkey safinis. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's definitely a Chinese artichoke. Mhm. Mm um. Yeah, it looks like a little witch tea grub or something. It looks really weird. Um, mm. Really delicious, really delicious. And no farty chokes. It's not, definitely not a farty choke. <laughs> no, it has the name, similar name. Um, at the moment in the, the forest garden course, we're at the stage of really looking at uh, shrubs and trees and things. So many of these things are not really shrubs or trees so does anyone have well Ellie Agnes obviously does anyone have any other suggestions for trees and shrubs and things as well 
anything else you want to ask? One, one that kept coming up for us was the, is it Siberian pea tree? Siberian pea tree. Because it was a protein nitrogen fixer um, and yeah. I suppose you can eat you, you can eat it. So um Biomass, very easy to chop down and keep uh, to a certain size, it keeps producing biomass, you can just keep chopping, dropping. So it's produces a lot of biomass for the rest of your system. You can make it as a hedge. Um but has anyone ever grown it and eaten peas from it? And actually how no, easy is this, it to hold? This is one question I had too, because um it seems that, that the pods are, you know, not really nice and tender. It's like they're really rough. And the seeds, I, this is something that I have observed. The seeds really come, come you know, they, the, the, the pod splits open very quickly and you can't get to harvest the seeds. And the trick I have used like this year to harvest some seeds, it's really the first year I have, have harvested some, is to pick the, the pods where they are almost ripe, but not really split open and they have split it open while they were drying this and is the siberian pea tree yes yes it had this habit but i haven't tried to cook the peas actually they were too little <laughs> i mean too few in the quantity mm -hmm. and i uh, wanted to you know save seeds and germinate some more and this is one question i really had perhaps you know i mean because martin crawford so much you know popularized this plant that i think you know, I have, I have been looking up for it for years, really. And it was like, you know, a little bit of a deception. Um, I, I got from two sources of seed and it was a little bit of deception because I really couldn't, it's not something that I could eat, but it's true. I have used it for biomass and it's good for pollinators. So it's got lots of other uses, but not so much as food <laughs> for us. So you see it in places like Finland quite often as just hedging. So it's, yeah. you know, it's literally not not you know edible garden but just as hedging so not necessarily as i say in food systems so it is used very popularly but yeah as a part of a food growing system this is yeah i don't know enough people who have enough experience of it to to say whether it really is worthwhile or not yeah, I was wondering, Sophie, if you guys have experience of it at the Balkan Ecology Project. Is that something you've tried out? Um, actually, I was just getting all ready to talk about a completely <laughs> different tree. We were just sitting here um, hoofing uh, Chef Shao and Pepper. Do you mind if I talk about Chef Shao and Pepper? Because I'll just try to put my camera on so you can see. Hang on a moment. Because I'm, <laughs> I don't know if it's, uh, it's actually really poor light in this room anyway. Hi, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I am actually uh, sitting here. We has anybody grown uh, Chef Chow and Pepo? It's Xanthus Island. I don't know whether it's Xanthus Island Simulans or Piperitum. Um, I get them muddled, but it's Xanthus Island species for sure. And um, it's so I've just been because we we um, sell the seeds in the bio nursery. So it's basically the when it produces, it produces a. Um, seed in a husk and a red husk and the red husk is what um, is the chef and pepper and it's such a curious taste so here i've got it here it's just i've just been shelling it and that is a spice that i'll use in the kitchen um, and it's, they say it's not a taste it's a sensation it is oh yes it it's is an a sensation <laughs> Okay, you if you eat it, five different flavors and then oh, that's so it's yeah. the five. Okay, yeah, that would make sense, and that's why it's called the five spice. Mm -hmm. And then, is yeah, the last part, which I'll let you explain. Okay, so it's it's a strange. If you eat it raw, if you try to eat it raw, it's it's quite numbing. It's got the numbing qualities of a clove, and it's really tingly. Um, but the taste, it's quite, it's minty. It's fresh it's like nothing I've ever tasted but it really elevates a dish and it's a great tree um, well really it's a shrub um, so you can grow it in a shrub layer but also could be lower canopy but I think it probably would grow in the UK I'm certainly going to take some of these seeds and um, try to germinate them and grow them on in Wales. Um, not self-fertile so if you've got you need more than two trees to really get so I've, I've got just one and I've actually got a Nepalese uh, pepper so um 
yeah so out of 100 seeds maybe 10 might be viable the rest are not because Do you know, I don't this is, think it needs it, to cross pollinate yeah it's really interesting um you say that because we we've got we found that so i knew that you needed two trees but somehow we had one one just one tree in that was producing so it, it was kind of really strange because it was going against everything we, that we'd read but it was um it's, this is it, what we it, were finding it was, fruit. it was still fruit it just needs that to make the seed viable yeah but we were the other the other thing we found which is quite interesting about this tree was that um it seems to you seem to be able to bypass the stratification process if you sowed the seed straight away which was really really weird because i've never you know that was just an experiment and it worked and the seeds um germinated in this we sowed them so like now-ish maybe about a little bit a few weeks in september maybe the end of september and by december they germinated so it's it's kind of been full of surprises um but full of my me harvesting my my peppers as well yeah and you eat the leaves as well no never didn't know you could eat the leaves, the leaves are fantastic so you can either eat them fresh straight off the tree uh, but i whatever i don't eat i dry and then just powder into to meals it's fantastic it's really subtle it doesn't have the numbing effect but mm. it has a really lovely flavor so it's good to hear that they're growing in the uk then that's yeah good and it's a it's a really it's a it's one of these trees i don't know well i guess it's the same in the uk but here in bulgaria you basically it takes it, it can take quite a lot of neglect which is which is kind of something that i quite want in my forest garden trees really um mm that you know they it doesn't need really any looking after for us and over here it can take a lot of drought and um, it's really hardy so i would say that that's a really good tree or shrub to consider for a forest garden it would it's definitely up there it, it, it's my current favorite plant i'm just like, i'm just sitting here sort of the aroma in the room but it's a yeah it's a really excellent plant so and um, green as well if you pick them green they're even stronger hmm. I think I'll, I'll leave that there, green, Rakesh. If you, if you pick them when they're still green, I mean, first of all, just taste it when it's green. It's really, really full on. But in my experience, the actual flavour of it lasts longer as well. So I've just been looking, I've just been giving away all my Szechuan pepper from last year. And you can see it's, it has kind of lost some of its kick. Um, so I'm literally giving jarfuls away to people. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good gift. I've just, I've just, I've just given some away as well about ten minutes ago or <laughs> to a visitor. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and for um, I think Belinda was asking. Yeah, the, the, it's all the xanthosylum. There's many different types of that xanthosylums. Uh, so the, the one I've got happens to be Nepalese pepper. Uh, the Szechuan pepper is the one that Sophie is referring to. Uh, but there's many others, in, um, but there are some, not all are as good as each other. So there's a variety that you'll see in the um, in arid, well, Mediterranean countries everywhere. You'll see it as a it's a it's a street tree, and while it looks very similar and it has the same pink kind of shell, uh, it's totally tasteless, absolutely tasteless. Um, but it's the same family. Prickly ash is a uh, is a is the UK uh, native variety of it, which has very similar properties. I've never tried it personally. I know that it has a, a big folklore of um, medicinal for medicinal purposes. But it's the same family. Same kind of family. I think I think I want I think I want lots of prickly ash, uh, both. I used to sell it in my shop, the spice, mm -hmm. and it's lovely. And I used the herbal tincture, but mm -hmm. um, I just remember the couple who live in Suffolk on our course had got a, a prickly ash, and it wasn't the one that they were thinking. So I'm, you know, anyway, they'll be growing all take over. Her off mine, then. Sorry. You can take her rootstock and graft a bit of mine. Yeah. Mine onto it. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Are the leaves of the uh, Xanthoxylium edible too, I have heard? Yeah, yeah, that's what we were saying. So I, you can eat them just when they're green and... Um, oh, so the leaves, not the seed. Both. You can eat the green seed, 
which is very, very strong. It has that full kick and lots of flavor. You can also eat the leaves when they're fresh green, you know, straight, just chew it like that. Um, you know, as you're walking by, just like a cow. Um, okay, just always do, just picking whatever I can find, whenever I can find it. And, uh, but then you can, when you harvest it, you can dry the leaves and use it in cooking later on. I have some one year seedlings, <laughs> which I'm waiting to grow. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic plant, love it. Have you tried tun, like tuna sinensis? I've also heard it's a nice tree, but uh, I've heard that the pink uh, leaves are, are one, ones are better than the green leaf, leafed ones. No, I haven't tried it, no. no. It's also something I'd like to try. I was at the Forest Garden Symposium this year that um, Martin Crawford organized, and there was some, yeah, really nice discussion about that and people talking about the different varieties. It was also a really nice talk about highly nutritious uh, tree crops. And that was one of the kind of like top five that's got great, highly nutritious leaves. Um, so yeah, that would be a nice one to try. Um, Which one the other one? Five, sorry to interrupt. Um, I think grape was one of them. That's got well, very maybe good Maybe type these out so people can see the names. Yeah, of course. So we've got grape. Is a good one. Uh, tune. I, I can put afterwards the Latin name. I think another month I can do a um, a session just on these tree crops actually because it's a nice topic to look at. Um, there was also um, linden. There was also mulberry. Um, and one more. Yeah, maybe. Someone else knows. I think Sophie, you guys were writing about leaf crops. What was that, Rakesh? Sea buckthorn. Sea buckthorn, it has got nutritious leaves, but I think that wasn't one that he was mentioning because the other ones, you know, if you uh, pollard the tree, you can actually keep getting fresh leaves and then you can use them like a salad. Um, oh, I missed that bit. So these are all. Uh, things for that are also have edible leaves. Yeah, yeah. Okay. In that case, um, goji. Yeah, goji. Look up the medicinal properties of goji leaves, not just the goji berry. The goji berry everyone knows is a superfood, but look up the medicinal properties of goji leaves. Really impressive. Not the tastiest thing. Yeah, that's thing, good but... because I don't get much fruits from my goji so i've got a lot of leaves it's like a nice ground cover that would be good to use the leaves yeah. with that instead uh, what about young hawthorn leaves i've never tried them ah yeah they're okay. also really good yeah they're not super tasty but they are really nutritious um i usually make like a hawthorn remedy throughout the year so first you make like a tincture with the leaves um, when it's just got fresh leaves and then you make another tincture or you add to the first tincture the flowers when it's flowering and then you make a third stage with the berry and then you have like a very deep remedy with each of the different energies um, of the plant. Um, so I know the leaves yeah have a lot of medicinal properties, a lot of nutrition um, and I've used small quantities while they're very fresh, the same like with um, silver birch leaves and with beech leaves you can also eat like a small quantity when they're very fresh um, but they're still quite fibrous yeah and some of them are better fermented like you know you can ferment um, grape leaves to make a dormadis um, I also did some experiment with like fermenting mulberry leaves because there are some like your mulberries you know that have these like giant leaves so they're pretty good for fermenting um, and it was going well, but it didn't last because I didn't have a cold enough place to store it. So I need to improve my cold storage because obviously they're fresh and then we have a really hot summer. Um, but yeah, that's something worth experimenting with that I'm going to do more of next year, like fermenting the leaves. It's Just great that you're fermenting that. leaves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the things fermented, that you uh, can do. Big leaves as well, in the same way as you do the mulberry and the... Uh, um, Great leaves, you can also mm -hmm. do fruit, which is actually also not so bad. 
Aha, uh -huh, I haven't tried it with fig leaves. Yeah, because yeah, I will. Really great. Mulberry, mm -hmm. yeah, fermented mulberry leaves, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and they're just so beautiful as well because if you have the, you know, the round varieties, obviously there are some that are more like kind of um, like scallop. Mitten, yeah. yeah. Like a kind of mitten, kind of yeah, a bit of an odd. <laughs> But yeah, the ones that are like kind of giant heart shaped, they're really, really nice. Um, and yeah, I was also just using them fresh and like rolling things up in them. But yeah, it's, it's a really interesting topic because obviously, yeah, they produce like such an abundance of leaves. And then you've got like, yeah, like a really nutritious salad without any of the work. Mm -hmm. And you just lacto ferment them. I mean, that's what I was doing. Yeah. With tea, yeah. of course, but lacto fermented. Yeah, of course, with chili, yeah. <laughs> and okay. I, I do, I, I put a lot of Szechuan pepper as well, or Nepalese pepper in my um, ferments as well. Yeah, lovely. Okay, so we're coming up to the time for the break. If anyone else has another burning suggestion that they want to add. Um, Can I jump in here? Yeah. Um. I was just, you know, listening to the very interesting discussion about uh, various plants and so on. And, you know, obviously there's quite a lot of overlap between the UK and Bulgaria um, and, and quite a, a number of plants that, you know, specifically grow well in Bulgaria that don't grow well in Britain. But there's quite a lot of overlap there. You know, um, I did a lot of my permaculture work in East Africa and, and coming back to Europe um, had to sort of completely rethink it, you know, being in the southern hemisphere being in a tropical climate, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and found that none of the trees that I used in my garden were applicable to the European climate. Certainly none of the perennials were, were applicable. Some of the annuals were. And, and I suppose, you know, the, the message that I got from that with, with my experimentation here is that you've, you've got to be very site specific in terms of choosing your canopy species. You know, you've got to do your research very carefully not, not just, oh, I'll grow some mulberry, but which specific type of mulberry, black mulberry, red mulberry, white mulberry, and then the different cultivars within that as well, you know, that uh, when you're doing your, your master plan for your forest garden, you know, that's a, a four-dimensional plan, you know, because you've got time in that as well. So you need to know, you know, about the growth rates and as well as the, you know, getting the plan right in terms of uh, where you locate the main canopy species in your in your plan and, and I thought something just occurred to me then actually um, before we go to the break and that is that this is a great idea and this is the first one I've joined in with and it's just very informative and interesting um, how about if this session was done during daylight hours because I, I'm on a laptop here which is a battery uh, and I expect most people are either on a phone or a, or a laptop um, you could actually do it from your garden you know, and it would be great to see other people's gardens. So, you, you know, I'm quite an isolated place here, really, in terms of permaculture. And, and I think that the other Bulgarians are as well, um, people who are doing permaculture in Bulgaria. And it would be lovely to see other people's um, forest gardens or permaculture gardens, whatever you want to call it. It would be lovely to see it and to see how they're developing, especially for somebody like me, who's quite new here. And all my plants are sort of less than head height at the moment, all my all my main trees are, 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 are less than head height, you know, and it's a very open and airy sort of place. And it'd be lovely to see, to have a wander through other people's forest gardens and see how they're looking. How does that sound? The only problem with that going into winter is obviously it's pitch black here and the clocks are gonna change. So by four o'clock, it's pitch black. So I'm not sure you're gonna see much right now, but in the you know, spring and summer, that would be a great idea. And there's something more interesting to see as well. Is it is it possible to do this on a on a Sunday afternoon, for example? We have a regular pattern. It's uh, it's at five o'clock every on the twenty second of every month. So, okay. I see. Yeah, it's just unless we decide, you know, the whole group decides to change it, uh, we've set a pattern for the next year for it to be at this time. But yeah, there's a nice suggestion here as well from Carolyn that everyone could record a video to share. So you could make a video wherever you want of yourself, like going around the garden. 
Um, and then, yeah, we could have a special edition, which would be like a garden sharing, and then people could show those videos there. Um, and that's, yeah, I think a nice way to combine the two, the two things. Also, it might be a bit easier so we're not like carrying laptops around the garden. <laughs> we, can, we can choose a good time. Um, so yeah, that's a really nice idea. We can put that, yeah, as a proposal for one of the next sessions. I do have um, some uh, videos and photos of my garden. I mean, I take some, uh, a set of, you know, videos or photos like at least once a year of everything and this year I even took more and they're on my Facebook <laughs> profile <laughs> if anyone wants and if anyone's interested I, I could share them with you in, in a session and explain what I have but I think my, my gardens are not so great perhaps as yours because you're more experienced than I, than I am <laughs> so but I think the I interesting think the thing with people's garden is not only like where it is now but also the vision like I really love seeing every stage of garden even when you're looking at like a blank space and someone's saying you know and this is where this is going to happen and in my design I have this area and I've been observing this so I think yeah it's like a dynamic process and kind of the the element of vision and possibility is a really nice part of it but can Very I just cute. say something there um I think that you know the idea of swapping videos and photos I mean it's a great idea. And that's what we do on Facebook. You know, I know you're on the Bulgaria permaculture site, for example, and, and, and so is the other Sophie. And, you know, I see pictures of your gardens there and, uh, and various other people. But it's the idea of being interactive so that someone can say to you, oh, what's that over there? Why did you put that apple there? Um, why is your pond over there, Steve? And why, what's the function of, of, of putting it on the north side of the garden or whatever? You know, it's just that it, it's that interactiveness of you know, of being able to do this. I mean, I, I, I'm quite happy to do it. You know, the, like like Rakesh says, it's it's not applicable at this time of year because um, it's what well, it's it's actually what is it dark here about half past six at the moment, isn't it in Bulgaria? Yeah. Um, until the clocks go back. Um, but yeah, in the spring, it would be lovely, and and I, I can certainly pick up the, the the laptop, you know, and and walk around the garden with it. And, uh, and and I'm sure other people could as well, or, or I can access this on my phone, I think. I, th I think mm -hmm. I can do the same thing on my phone. And, you know, and, and that might help people. And, and I'd love to see your garden and, and other people's gardens and ask you questions about it rather than me driving over to see you, you know. Um, it was just it, the idea of being able to interact in a live setting, a live forum with, with somebody and ask questions. That was, that was the point, really, of my, of my question um, for the group. Yeah, so that's really nice. Then yeah, we can think about that in the in the spring. I think that would be really nice because then yeah, we'll have yeah everything growing. You'll be able to see the trees and then all the herbaceous layer and things as well. So yeah, let's keep that in mind. And yeah, I understand what you mean, Steve. Having the interactive element is nice. Like yeah, when I'm showing people the garden, they're interacting, and so yeah, I tailor what I'm explaining based on their questions and what they're interested in. Um, uh, there are a few questions in the, the chat. Can I can just maybe quickly look at those? So, for example, yeah, for about sure. medlars. So, medlars do grow uh, well enough in the UK, but they won't uh, ripen on the tree. That's the difference. Whereas in Croatia, where I used to live, they'll ripen on the tree. You can just pick it straight from there and just eat it uh, because it's got a long enough summer. But here, uh, you have to wait until the first frost. And I mean, it rots. I mean, the technical term is it's bletted, but the reality is it starts to rot. And uh, that's what makes it, um, yeah, edible. Um, you can try collecting them and just putting them in the fridge or something to kind of replicate that. But yeah, the, the, the fruit itself will grow really well. Um, where was I? In, I was in the Netherlands, in uh, Amsterdam. And there was a tree there that was just laden with it. And it was really exposed, really cold, obviously by canals and things. Um, but it, it was absolutely heaving. And uh, we've got one planted, not you know, just in a local park here. It's still quite young, it's two, three years old, and it's really been neglected. Uh, you know, there's all kind of you know, the typical council kind of, let's just 
ticks and boxes, plant some trees, but who cares about actually taking care of them? Um, but yeah, but it grows really well. And what were the other questions? I think there was something. It's a beautiful about... tree. I love the medley. It's a lo lovely one for a forest garden. A beautiful autumn colours. One of the best. Yeah, yeah. And it's Not also very nice because you can it. graft it onto hawthorn as well. So if you've got hawthorns growing wild, you can graft medlar onto it and you'll get actually some fruit on the first year after you graft it. So it's like very quick to produce in that situation. A uh, question about black walnut. Um, Belinda said black walnut is a total no-no. And does anyone have experience with bladder nut? The black walnut, um, just thinking about it, yeah, mostly, I've eaten it mostly in continental Europe. So, can't, I mean, it goes crazy in Croatia. Denmark, we didn't have much success there. It's still pretty small. Um, yeah, in a lot of continental Europe, it grows really well. But in England, actually Netherlands, I've had tons in Netherlands. So it should theoretically grow here in England, but as you know, I don't really spend much time here. Um, but I did see someone had planted a black walnut literally two metres outside of our forest garden. So uh, I... I, it's someone's, it wasn't one of us, but someone else has actually planted a walnut just outside the boundaries of our forest garden. And it's not the park keeper, that's for sure. I, I just heard that they were like, they just, nothing grows within. That's rubbish. Hundreds. Yeah, I, don't, I can't remember where I saw it. And I just thought, oh. So they do, they, they, they do leach out um, chemicals into the soil, which basically the, the purpose of that is to prevent their yeah. own fruit from fruiting. Yeah. But it's absolutely rubbish. And it's, it cheeses me off how many people say this. Don't plant it because nothing yeah, grows under it. I can show you hundreds of photographs that, of things growing underneath it. Okay, that's why I asked. You won't grow your carrots underneath it yet. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. And if you want tomatoes growing under it, forget it. But there's so many things that will uh, will grow under it. So it's it's just how well it fruits. But hey, if it doesn't ripen properly, you know, just pickle it. Pickled uh, pickled walnuts, fantastic. Or um, in Albania, they make a, like a marabba. Um, I don't know what's that in English, like where you, you put it in sugar syrup. Ca candied? Is that? The yeah, candied walnut. Candied walnut? Yeah. Oh, unreal. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so even if it doesn't fruit, go, go all the way to ripening properly, who cares? You know, you, there's many ways to eat it. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty certain it will fruit well here. Are you talking, uh, have you been talking about the uh, Juglans Nigra or about the Juglans Regia? Uh, nigra. Nigra? Because that, that's a fruit that is very, like you can't deshell it, it's very tough. Like you can't use the fruit. Ah, is okay. that why they, I don't know. Um, yeah. So the regular walnut is the Juglans Regia and Juglans Nigra is the one which, which is, is the American one. And used medicinally. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's and it's said that the Juglans Nigra is a lot, I don't know, like 10 times more, puts more Juglan than the Juglans Regia, which is the uh, European one, which we, which we use, for, which we get walnuts out of. And okay. I've heard also that Juglans Nigra is more so more grown for wood because it gets a straight trunk than the Regia, which has lots of branches and is not so useful. Mm -hmm. So for in my opinion, I had that the Juglans Nigra is just good for, well, perhaps medicinally, I don't know, but it's just for timber after all. Like the, in, in Croatia, they call it black walnut. And yes. So maybe, again, this is like common names not being so yeah. common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it is absolutely, definitely edible. Yeah, okay. Definitely edible. But yeah, but you're right, the, the common walnut is uh, regia. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, it's just the common name is, as I say. Um, yeah, because they call it black walnut. And uh, interestingly, for some reason, they call, um, they actually call it uh, Indian. Uh, 
Hold on. No, they're called cashew nut Indian walnut for some reason. Um, ah, so in Bulgarian, Indiski orek, this is orek. nutmeg. Okay, in, yeah, in, in, in Croatian would be uh, sweet, it would be uh, cashew nut. Ah, yeah, and here it's nutmeg. So yeah, it's quite funny, all these common names. Um, yeah. Really confusing between languages, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've heard the same about black walnut, that it's used a lot in North America in kind of agroforestry for the timber. Um, and that the fruits are kind of, yeah, like small and hard and quite difficult to shell. We, we had, uh, I mean, one project we have is on a location which it turns out had black walnut and uh, I didn't recognize it at first. I thought, well, it's just walnut. And then when seeing the details, well, this is not the walnut. <laughs> it doesn't have the leaf of a walnut. So I have finally identified it as black walnut. And then to be honest, I don't know, I, I said to the, the owner, you know, it's used for timber. Do you want timber? If you don't want timber, better cut them off. <laughs> because really, really, that juglone, thi juglone thing, apparently, all the, those stories are about the juglans nigra, not about the juglans regia. So if you are you, we are used to, okay, we can grow something under a walnut. It seems that under the... <laughs> <laughs> the Juglans Nigra, it's tougher. <laughs> and those stories might be true. We haven't seen it. I mean, I haven't seen it in reality. <laughs> I don't know. Nice. Okay. I haven't actually seen black walnuts um, here in Bulgaria. I mean, you know, the, the countryside here is full of walnuts. And this time of year, they, they're falling. For, if you go out in my garden now, you, you'd need to wear a hard hat if you walk under the walnut tree because they're just dropping on the ground all the time. And, and they're, they're a sort of um, very much part of the culture here in, in Bulgaria. Um, and we're, I'm experimenting with what you can grow underneath them because our garden has the most enormous walnut tree right in the middle of it um, that you've ever seen. Uh, so, you know, we, we're experimenting with what grows underneath it. And um, the problem is the eugline, which is obviously poisonous, as, as other people have pointed out. Uh, but it's also that the roots are extremely uh, efficient at extracting moisture and nutrients from the soil. So you have to be careful. You know, it says that raspberries will grow underneath um, walnuts, but they struggle because there's, there's just a lack of nutrients, uh, really. Uh, and we found the only way is to put raised beds underneath the drip line of the walnut on the south side. Uh, and then uh, if you put something like plastic at the bottom of the raised bed, then you, know, you can grow underneath the, the walnut. But black walnut, I've not come across that in, uh, in, in Bulgaria, or, although I've seen it in, in the States. Um, and yeah, it's, 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 it's a real problem if you've got one in your garden. It's extremely invasive and um, you know, the, the poison is quite, um, quite strong. Um, and what was the other one? The medlars. Yeah, we've got a couple of medlar trees here and they, they grow extremely well in, in Bulgaria and they ripen on the trees. And, the other, the other Bulgarians watching will know. Um, quince is one that I'll mention as well. Quince, quinces grow really well here. Um, apples and pears. Um, and um, uh, we, we grow something called a jujube here. Uh, I don't know whether other people have heard of that. Yeah, yeah Rakesh is giving mm -hmm. it a thumbs up there, you know. And uh, I'm trying to, trying to think of the name of it in Bulgarian. I can't for the life of me remember the name of it in Bulgarian. But they grow pretty well here, and, and that's Zizipus. a plant that likes Zizipus. a continental plant. Eh? Zizipus. What a name. Yeah. Yeah. Zizipus jujube. It's, Isn't uh, it uh, Hinap? Hinap, yeah. Hinap, that's it, yeah. Hinap. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, there's all kinds of varieties of that, like uh, the plenty that are native, for example, to India. And, um, you know, you get every, everything from kind of this size fruit to kind of this size fruit. Um, but really, 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 really prolific, really prolific fruit and very easy, very easy one to grow. It's kind of, Delicious. I don't know, a little bit like an apple, um, like a, a very firm apple, but in a olive kind of shape. Yeah. yeah, and it becomes a little bit like a date because when it starts to soften, it's then not so crunchy and then it starts to get very sweet. So it's a bit like a kind of fresh date. There's a variety that grows in Turkey that uh, uh, you, you leave it on the tree and it quite literally um, turns to sugar. 
and it's like candy floss. You pick it from the tree and you open it up and it's just these like little hairs, almost like candy floss kind of hairs inside it. And it's definitely a jujube. Mm. I think I've got some downstairs, which a Turkish friend of mine, which I asked a Turkish friend of mine to get when she last went to Turkey. Delicious. Fantastic. Beautiful. Plant. So I feel mm, like we can speak probably all night about our love of plants. Belinda has um, a burning question, I think. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for it. We have some flexibility in the in the schedule. So yeah, go for it. Um, I just I said I was looking up um, Juglans in the um, medicinal uh, forest garden handbook that with Anne Stobart is a herbalist because I want to grow the herbal ones and uh, she seems to be saying Juglans regia to grow. I, I'll have to ask her. She actually does a really uh, reasonable course that is um, from uh, for online course it's video one and it's very cheap um <laughs> good and i'm on it i haven't finished it yet but it's um videos and they have it so it's worth if you're interested in medicinal trees and medicinal forest gardening it's um a good excess so i'll ask her <laughs> about that i've never grown bladder nut Lovely. anyone grown bladder nut before Caroline's asking. I have also no experience with them. I don't know, Sophie, Steve, if I were of you have experience. No, I don't. Okay, so no. that's uh, something to check for next time. And let's just find the author of this book and still bard. Uh -huh, great. Uh, okay, yeah. so yeah, let's move. Is that enough, Kirsty? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. That was so insightful. What uh, a room full of experience and knowledge, and yeah, thank you. That was uh, amazing. Okay. I think you yeah, tried when some you of get the fresh one pepper. Yeah. I can't remember if it was this year's or last year's, but uh, if it was a little bit greenish, it would have been this year's. Really strong. Um, Delicious. Fantastic. I think the other the other easy one to get into a forest garden is raspberries, because let's face it, as your forest garden grows and as the trees start to grow, the um, the raspberries just move. They'll just find their space. They'll you know. So it's one of these plants that just grows as your forest garden grows. I love uh, the shrubs, the gooseberries and the currants because they are partial shade uh, tolerant and there's yeah. usually lots of shade <laughs> under trees. So yeah. they're one of my yeah. favorites. Yeah, Worcester berries, Joster berries, red currants, black currants, white currants, all of those kind of things. Japanese quince is quite a nice shrub. Um, yep. And while we're still on plants, because <laughs> though we're moving, slowly moving off there, but we haven't managed to yet. I just really want to put a shout out for the alliums. Um, because I just I just can't have enough alliums. Really got into them this year, more than ever, had different species growing around. But I think alliums are just such a great, a great plant to have in the garden. Yeah, wonderful. Maybe if um, you have please so like a session for us on alliums at some point from your or your experience with them? Well, I'm in the garden. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I haven't got tons of experience with them. Um, I've got experience with a few sort of firm favourites, but it's really the last year, last couple of years, we started to develop an allium nursery and then, you know, just realised how uh, incredible they are because they're all, I think they're pretty much all, I don't know, I think they're all edible actually, but most of them are edible. And the flowers, you've got just such a big variety of flower colour or flowering times. And they're just a really nice different architecture in the garden. You know, just it gives, it's a nice focal point, it's something, it's quite different plant architecture, which is nice. The different textures and colours in the garden are always good. And yeah. And quite often they're, um, yeah, really they're good pollinating the plant as well. They're in the Sorry? They're in the Liliaceae family, and so there's many toxic things in that family as well as edible things. 
Right. So you do need to be a little bit careful. Uh, but um, but in yeah. terms of alliums, are there actually any? Um, I mean, I know there are some that are in, inedible, but I don't think I'm not sure. But I don't think that there are any toxic alliums. But I don't. I don't know. I, I have asked. I have asked that question too, and apparently they are not. I mean, no one knows any toxic allium. Just you know, yeah. some which perhaps are not very palatable, I right? Think I think I've read there's a, there are three or four. Um, I remember someone else uh, putting this out as a fact that you definitely 100% can eat all alliums, and I checked it up and I found I think three that are actually toxic. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll backtrack, it was on WhatsApp, so the chance of me finding it again, I think, is zero, but um. I can maybe try and do the it would be research. nice to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe on the certain. plant for a future as well, because they have some entries about specific family. Or I can check in the botany in a day uh, book. Because they've but also the good got thing nice about family. the alliums is that their, their scent is very strong and therefore they make really good insect attractors and repellents. So there's a lot of anecdotal evidence to show that planting alliums around your fruit trees in particular really benefits the fruit trees and as you know a lot of the alliums will come up quite early you know the the, the perennial alliums as opposed to the the kind of uh, kitchen onion um, and so they make a really good ground cover quite early in the season um, you know things like most people probably know allium ursinum wild garlic uh, bear lauf or whatever kind of language you speak um, <laughs> And then Allium triquetrum is the one that, that just grows crazy in my garden. It, uh, and yeah, and I have, we have maybe two, two rounds. So it's all growing again now. It's just come back this, um, in the last couple of months. That's the second round. Yeah, yeah I, sadly, I, 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 all that. my Allium, sorry, Santi. Oh, I was just gonna, yeah, I was just gonna say Allium tuberosum, the garlic chives is um, a personal favorite. And the funniest one is maybe um, the Egyptian walking onion, which uh, has been walking around my garden for the last 15 years. <laughs> it's really funny. Um, can I mention leeks? Of course you can, Steve. You're from Wales. <laughs> yes, well, here they are. These are my leeks here. Um, Bulgarian leeks. Um, yeah, the tallest leeks in things. the world. Yeah, look, you see, they're taller than me. <laughs> now I'm sitting down, <laughs> but uh, yeah, leeks grow really well here. Uh, uh, good. Me are, are they a member of the Allium family? I think they are. Yeah. Are they, yeah. yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. Rakesh is nodding his head. There. Yeah. So, you know, um, we, we plant rows of these things here, and um, they, they're just they're just amazing. There's no pests and diseases, and um, they they. They're growing now, and it's it's uh, you know nearly November, and um, we dig them up and put them in sand and, uh, and store them through the winter and so on. And uh, yeah, we've got a number of alliums here as well, you know, garlic chives and chives and and things like that, and and they're really useful. And um, like like uh, Rakesh was saying, you know, they, they come up so early. You know, chives come up in March, and your spring onions are still under the snow when the chives are coming up here, and um, very hardy, uh, perennial, um, a great flavour. Um, and, um, you know, the, our garden is dominated by annuals at the moment, but gradually, you know, as the perennials take over, the, the number of annuals is, uh, is decreasing. You know, that, that's the sort of the fourth dimension of uh, forest gardening, isn't it? The, the time dimension where things, uh, the perennial plants come into their own after two or three years and begin to replace the annuals, you know, and sort of we, we started a, a forest garden and I'm sort of horrified at the, the, um, the number of annuals. I'm planting, but uh, hopefully they'll, they'll they'll take over in in time. So there you are. This my giant yeah, Bulgarian. Yes. We've got about thirty five minutes left. So can I suggest maybe we take a five minute break, and then we've got one more session that we wanted to do. And this is, I think, I don't know how long this has gone over by, but but quite yeah, quite considerably over time, I think. Yeah, we've gone over quite a lot, but I also added some extra time at the end. So I think we still have time to, to cover some things. Okay. Um, so yeah, let's have a break and we'll go up to the top of the hour. And then, yeah, we we'll have like 20 minutes for the last session and then 10 minutes for the help. Wonderful.
Okay. See you in five.